Good morning and welcome to our event around uh, uh, improving outcomes in government through intelligent automation. Uh, I am Dan Chenoff, uh, the Executive Director of the IBM Center for the Business of Government. I want to thank uh, Tracy Berglund, our uh, gra graphic design specialist, who you've been watching, those of you that have signed on, who's going to who's been capturing some of the themes for the event uh, thus far in terms of the work that has been done that I'll explain momentarily, and we'll also capture the uh, work going on uh, to come. Um, so uh, what we think today really to talk about is um, uh, the culmination of a year's worth of work that we've done with the Partnership for Public Service. And I am pleased here to be joined by uh, an executive from the Partnership for Public Service who has been a close colleague of ours in this journey through how a government agencies can use intelligent automation, artificial intelligence, and analytics to drive improved outcomes. Uh, Katie Malek from the Partnership. Katie, do you want to just introduce yourself and say hello? Hi, Dan. I'm Katie Malek with the Partnership for Public Service. Great to be here this morning. Um, thanks, Katie. Welcome. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague from IBM, who will talk uh, in uh, a few minutes about the, the topic of intelligent automation and, and analytics uh, in government. And that's Leanne Hazelton. Uh, Leanne, would you like to say hello? Good morning. This is Leanne Hazelton. I'm an executive in IBM uh, federal sector. And I uh, look forward to, to this presentation and to hearing all from all of you today. Uh, Thank you, Leanne and Katie and Tracy. And uh, in a few moments, we'll introduce the uh, panelists, uh, our, our expert leaders from government who will have a conversation with us. Uh, but first, just to, uh, again, we completed a year's worth of work with a partnership where we spoke with government leaders in a series of webinars, five in all, uh, uh, around their work on introducing this concept of intelligent automation, the use of artificial intelligence, robotics process automation, uh, uh, the Internet of Things and other emerging technologies as a way to really drive agencies forward in capitalizing on those technologies to improve their mission. Moreover, these technologies allow agencies to use uh, data to make decisions in new and creative ways that they never could have dreamed possible before the, the advent of these technologies. And, and through this partnership that we have uh, engaged in with the Partnership for Public Service, uh, we have really learned a lot about how the government has used intelligent automation and analytics to drive improved outcomes, as well as some challenges that they've faced and how they've overcome those challenges. We've created learning opportunities that hundreds and even thousands of, of people have signed on to uh, in terms of, of viewing those sessions previously. And today we're very fortunate to have three of our leaders from those sessions who will talk in a few minutes about current work that their agencies are doing uh, in these areas. Um, I again wanna thank the Partnership for Public Service um, for the work that we've done. Actually, last year was the second year of a long-term work program that we've had on, on emerging technologies with them. The first year we did fo a focus specifically on artificial intelligence. And I especially want to thank uh, Peter Kamachai, who has uh, been just a tremendous leader at, at the partnership in terms of doing all the analysis and working with speakers and, and being a partner of ours uh, through the session. And of course, Katie Maleg, um, who has been such a, a great uh, a great friend and colleague of the centers for many years. Uh, Katie, before we get to our all-star panel of government speakers, would you like to say a few words? Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that kind introduction. And good morning to everyone and welcome to today's event. As Dan said, I'm Katie Maleg with the Partnership for Public Service. And as you might know, the partnership is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that strives for a more effective federal government. And today's event, as Dan mentioned, is the culmination of a year-long effort between the partnership and the IBM Center. And as we begin, I'd like to share the thanks back to the IBM Center. They have been years-long collaborators with the partnership on thought leadership around emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence and intelligent automation. And we are just always delighted to collaborate and partner with them. So thank you to Dan in particular. I'd note the recent events in our country have highlighted the many ways in which we rely on our federal government and particularly the importance of our public servants. And so as we start today's discussion, I want to begin by thanking all of our participants who serve in government and have served in government for your service. This past year has also demonstrated the need for effective government. And this project has made clear that our government leaders and federal employees 
are really ready to tackle the challenges our country faces, and they're ready to deploy uh, in innovative ideas, practices, and technologies like those we'll discuss today. So I'm really grateful to join today's discussion, and thank you all again for participating today. And Leanne, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, it is a pleasure. It is a pleasure to join you, the partnership, uh, the Center for Business and Government, um, this entire team this morning. Uh, at IBM Federal, I run our data analytics and AI practice area, and it is just an exciting place to be. Um, the young, energized, enthusiastic, brilliant talent that that we bring in every year um, that the schools are generating, really, it, it just uh, energizes the uh, and the environment in this space. Um, I, I also, uh, you'll hear a lot about technology, emerging technologies, um, how we can do things um, better, faster, more efficiently with automation. But I also want to emphasize that with all of these technologies, um, at the core, what we're really looking at is still very human-centered. Um, the true focus of every data initiative, every analytics, uh, every automation initiative, whether it incorporates emerging technologies or basic data, data science, um, it's really about the people on the other side. And it's really about using those data and technologies to make better informed and effective decisions. So uh, as always, I'm excited to hear uh, what, our, what our wonderful presenters have to say today and share with us. And um, at, that, at this point, uh, thank you all again for inviting me and I'll turn it back over to Dan. Well, thank you, Leanne and Katie and Tracy. And, and um, we are now going to turn to the panel discussion. So I'd like to invite each of the panelists to make sure you've unmuted your, your line. And um, I'm gonna introduce you uh, one by one. And if you could just say a few words about yourself, that would be great. So let me start with um, Alka Patel from the Current Events uh, Joint AI Center. Alka? Hi, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you here today. Um, really appreciate it. So um, I, I am Alka Patel. I'm the head of AI ethics policy at the Joint AI Center at the Department of Defense, where our mission is really focused on uh, enabling the adoption and the integration or implementation of AI at scale across the department. And I'll just say really briefly, Dan, um, really excited to be here in terms of your special milestone of, of really this culmination of great work that you've done over the past year, because um, at the department, we just hit a milestone today as well, which is that it is a one year anniversary of the adoption of the AI ethics. And uh, that is really critical and helpful to my role in terms of having the operational assistance. So um, just wanted to, to, to share sort of the, the milestone. So thank you again for having me. Uh, thank you, Alka. And next, I'd like to introduce Jen Edgen from the U.S. Marine Corps. Jen? Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan, and for the partnership for hosting this event. Uh, I'm the Assistant Co uh, Deputy Commandant for Information, and I also happen to serve as uh, the Marine Corps AI Service Level uh, Coordinator. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to be here uh, and uh, continue our conversation about the journey that the Marine Corps is on through our entire force design initiatives uh, enabled by AI. Uh, thank you, Jen. And last, uh, we have uh, Mike Peckham from HHS. Mike? Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, happy I was invited for this conversation. I'm currently the um, acting CFO at the Program Support Center. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about today is work that I did while leading the reInvent Grants Management Project for HHS under the Reimagine HHS Project. Um, I got to play around with a lot of really cool tools, all the emerging technology, the buzzwords, and I'm really excited to just share what we were able to accomplish today. Thank you, Mike. And I just wanna make sure from a technical perspective that we've got Alka on video. Um, uh, Alka, can you um, uh, just again say hello and um, let's make sure that we've got you you on the screen in terms of, of your work. So just say a little bit more about uh, the work of the Jake. Uh, and that would be great as, as just to start off. Sure, uh, no worries. Um, so hopefully uh, my video will show in a second here, but I'm really excited to talk about some of the efforts that are happening at, at the Jake um, as we pivot to a Jake 2.0, which I will be uh, more than excited to share some of uh, those, those efforts and how they really advance uh, not only uh, responsible AI across the department, but really um, the scaling of AI, as we mentioned. So. All right, we've got everybody on online. Thank you, uh, Alka, Jen, and Mike. And uh, let me uh, go to the first question. When we talked with each of you last year, 
you provided insights on actions and initiatives in each of your agencies to bring intelligent automation forward and using data effectively and, and responsibly. Um, can each of you briefly summarize that work for today's audience and provide any updates on progress? And, and Mike, can we start with you? Absolutely. So I did get to share with you uh, the work under the reInvent Grants Management Project. Uh, I had nine different initiatives, but the fun one was the grant recipient digital dossier. And so that was about the idea of, are there applications that can be applied to the problems that we're seeing across the grants community that are going to make life easier for everybody? And that's not just the grantor community, but it's the grant recipient community. And this really goes back to the data act and the idea of, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff to, uh, to improve um, on the federal side of the house, but we don't always look at the downstream impacts of what happens once the recipients of grants receive money. And are there actions that we're taking that are breaking systems and processes for them? So we employed human centered design. We talked with everybody across the board. We found out very quickly that there is a uh, risk assessment that is required for every new award and now under 2 CFR 200, the omitted version, it's required each time money goes out to a recipient. That takes approximately four to eight hours to perform under the old standards. So we talked to the different um, user groups and we said, hey, we think we have our use case. And so we dove in and understanding that there were seven different sources that folks were basically pulling information from they were doing it in disparate, different and disparate ways. So one, the risk assessment from that perspective was being seen as very subjective. Um, also, it was hard to get to some of that data for people. Um, the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, it takes about 17 clicks to get to the data and that's if you know exactly where you're going. Um, I go back to my old days, you count clicks because that's time and time is money. So um, what we did was we said, okay, what is the issue or the challenge that we're facing and then we looked at the right emerging technology to apply to the challenge. And in the case of the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, we didn't have an API or something where we could just ingest the data. So we, we employed uh, RPA. Um, we do a scrape every single night, we pull the information over, and then we run through it with natural language processing to make sense of it because this is unstructured data. And then on top of that, we're applying AI to make sense of the data. Um, one of the findings we had is there are a lot of financial findings in the single audits. Now, a single audit is performed any time a grant recipient receives over $750,000 in, in a year from the federal government. Um, the auditors will come in, they will do the single audit, they will file that with the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, and then that information is utilized, I would say, across the federal government in so many different ways. And I'm focused in on this one particular area of how we you know, used emerging technology because I think that if we could start to understand how we unlock the data, we can go to the source areas and improve the source areas and really make that data available readily. This is public information. And uh, my goal has always been, how do we introduce the data to the private sector if it's public information and allow them to start doing analysis on that that we've never even thought of before. Um, we have been able to determine a lot of information utilizing this approach that we never had access to previously. We have taken a four hour process, and that's a lean estimate, down to 15 minutes, utilizing the different types of AI to ingest this data and display this data. We are looking at $142 million, and I will say return to mission on an annual basis, because we want those dollars to go to the mission purpose that they were intended, not to the administrative overhead, which is where a lot of that funding is going right now. So in a nutshell, um, this is just the start. Um, and that's why I said earlier, it's exciting to sit here and talk about this because I've come over to the Program Support Center. We've implemented RPA on a very simple process and seen an 82% efficiency improvement. Um, I, I think the other speakers here today are gonna talk about the ideas and concepts of, of where we can go with this. I'm just excited that we're actually applying it, using it and seeing some really, really good results. Well, thank you, Mike, for that uh, excellent discussion of the work you've done. Alka, you're thinking about this more generally. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the use of intelligent automation and AI uh, for, for the mission space across the defense department? 
Sure, and and I'll talk about it uh, perhaps from from three different aspects, and and I'm going to lean in on uh, I think something Leanne had said at the beginning in terms of uh, all of this being human centric and the focus on people. Um, so so I'm going to talk just for a moment in regards to our efforts around um, our workforce education that's, that 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 uh, speaks to this, as well as some of our acquisition efforts and our focus on our platform. So really at a high level, um, thinking through how we engage people in our workforce education efforts, um, it's really a focus on how how do we make sure that everyone has an understanding in regards to um, uh, the da data readiness, right? Like as we're thinking about automation, as we're thinking about creating these AI enabled te technologies, how do we define AI readiness? And, and I think the one thing that I'm sure all of us are probably seeing is that we all have different definitions, frankly, of what data readiness looks like. And perhaps as we work with our acquisition partners, that may be something else. And as we engage with our allies, something else. And so how do we come to uh, a standard, so to speak, around data readiness? Um, in addition to, to sort of defining that, also thinking about the associated processes. So I think when I was here last, um, I was here with Brian Lane from GSA, and we were talking a lot about the fact that we had created these pools of data cards, um, data catalogs, and, and really at that point, we're building out a data governance structure. And so um, just want to highlight the criticality of the fact that as we talk about data, we need to have the appropriate governance structures, the controls, the oversight, the reviews, the, the place for those types of discussions to occur. And so building out a data governance council with, with the appropriate subject matter expertise at the appropriate times is, has also been a critical um, aspect that we've been working on at the Jake. And then in terms of the acquisition side, um, I wanted to highlight that um, one of the efforts that we have and, and will be soon to be released is a data readiness RFI. Um, for those of you who may be aware, we just released a T&E one, but the, re the data readiness um, RFI is really all around um, data management, um, information management, data security, all of those aspects of data that we need to be thinking about and engaging with industry and our commercial partners to find um, those types of services and that vehicle at the end of the day is one that is not only to be leveraged at the take, but is, is going to be uh, able to be leveraged across the DOD. And so when we think about how do we have consistency of services, how do we scale some of our efforts, um, that's gonna be a critical aspect of what we're gonna do. And then lastly, um, the Joint Common Foundation, which is our, our infrastructure, our DevSecOps environment that we are creating where the data will reside, where our data catalog is and, and so forth, it's really um, a critical piece, uh, specifically from my perspective, as we think about how do we uh, integrate tools such as those data cards and catalogs, and uh, how do we integrate those actually into the into the workflows, um, ensure that the necessary uh, um, uh, assessment points are also uh, integrated into those workflows. And then um, automating some of this, right? So that it, it, it just becomes automatic as part of a developer's uh, work as they, they realize that, okay, as the data's coming in, um, has there been a data card associated with that data set? Has it been reviewed? Who's been reviewing it? Um, what do we need to do in addition? Do we have to do additional impact assessments and so forth? So I think um, the platform aspect, again, when we think about how we scale across the DOD is, is a critical way for us to really um, uh, bacon ethics uh, across the entire product life cycle, which is something that we focus on, but really um, uh, highlighting uh, the data aspect as well. Well, thanks, Alka, and that's a really interesting way to think about a whole of agency approach through data governance and integrating technology and data into the into the uh, what DoD would refers to as the Joint Common Foundation that could be replicated in other agencies for their missions as well. So one of those agencies within DOD, of course, is the U.S. Marine Corps. And Jen, I know you've, you've been doing some terrific work on, on applying this in uh, the Marine Corps setting. Can you talk about that? Uh, sure. And to start off my response, uh, I'd like to provide some context for why. And when uh, the Commandant uh, published his uh, planning guidance, it really set the stage for the entire modernization of the Marine Corps, design, uh, looking at how we were designing and building a more lethal, maneuverable uh, naval force. And in that document, he actually highlighted that uh, he, the intent of uh, AI, data science, uh, all of these uh, initiatives is uh, designed to unleash the power of the individual Marine. 
Um, so that's been a great rallying cry as we've uh, gone through the last year of uh, the exploratory phase. Um, how can we use AI technology? How do we pair Marines with machines to be more effective in all of the situations that they find themselves? Uh, for example, you know, building on Mike's example in Alcas, you know, a Marine uh, can be uh, functioning in an office environment, uh, working with our programs and resources acquisition shop. They can also be uh, in a, a, a MAGTAF deployed on an expeditionary, expeditionary unit. So our ch challenge is how do we uh, identify these appropriate use cases, sequence them over time, and then also leverage all of the investments across the DOD. It's 2021, we don't have to do this on our own anymore. And that's really uh, where the power of the Jake construct and some of the uh, items that uh, Alka highlighted uh, pay dividends for us. Uh, the Marine Corps uh, has been snapped into uh, the greater DOD efforts for uh, workforce uh, modernization, uh, taking advantage of some of the pilot programs to immerse our Marines in uh, data, uh, in data science and AI education. Uh, we've also uh, been big proponents of use of the uh, joint common foundations, uh, because if we look at our design, development, uh, deployment, and disposal cycle, those pipelines, uh, not just from the technical side, but also from the contractual side, become very, very powerful. And ultimately, this is creating partnerships. So uh, the Jake, other organizations bringing to, get, uh, to bear some really key subject matter expertise in AI, Marines coming to the table with their problem statements, their pain points, uh, how they want things to work. Imagine those two forces coming together uh, and uh, using joint common foundations, using our DevSecOps pipeline to deliver real capabilities that are snapped into the force design uh, uh, greater effort. Well, thanks, Jen. What a terrific application in the mission space of the concepts that Mike and Elka uh, laid out. And uh, before we get to the next question, I just want to remind uh, those joining us from the uh, audience, participants on the webinar, if you want to ask questions at any time, there's a Q&A tab uh, on your screen. Uh, feel free to put your question into the Q&A, and we'll get to questions uh, in about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, we'll um, we'll ask your questions at that point, but feel free to start start populating now, and then we'll we'll go through the questions uh, as we go uh, later in the in the discussion. So, getting back to the uh, panel, um, how do your agencies? We, we've talked a lot about impacting the mission, impacting the the the, the oh, DoD uh, people in theater, HHS practitioners. How do you involve those users in developing and designing? data strategies and, and thinking about the design piece of intelligent automation. Um, anybody want to take that on? Well, I'd be happy to, to start. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of human or user-centered design. Uh, I think that you really need to talk to the people and understand what the challenges are that they've faced in the past and where they're trying to go. Um, that's the most important piece of this. If we if we have data and we can unlock the data, there are always going to be more questions, inevitably. But if we start with the initial, what problem are you trying to solve and how can we solve that for you? Then we can curate, we can cleanse, and we can display the data based on the factors that are being described to us. That will lead to more questions, which will obviously lead to the need for more answers. Um, but you start small, you grow it out, um, using the agile approach allows you to create something, go back to the user very quickly and say, hey, did we hit the mark or did we miss it? Um, that's so important because in Waterfall, I mean, I was involved in several Waterfall projects where you give your, your developers some information, they go away for two to three months and then they come back and say, hey, did we get it right? And at that point, things are really hard coded, they're hard to change um, and maybe you didn't get it right. Um, with Agile, you've got more of that show me. You can show it to the user right away. They can look at it and they can say, you totally missed it, or they can say, you're almost there. You're on the right track. Um, but to me, that's the key ingredient to getting this off the ground and just started in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. And Jen, you're working with um, uh, your colleagues all the time across the Marine Corps around the world. Uh, how are they involved? Uh, so we we also use a user-centered design approach. And uh, when I say that, I also follow that up with user-centered design is a contact full-time sport. <laughs> um, so uh, through our, and that to us looks like arming Marines with tool sets 
tool sets to decompose their problems, tool sets to, if you have an idea in AI, well, it, how, uh, how does that idea show business or mission value? And we actually have a template that walks users through the decomposition of the problem. We have uh, the uh, expected criteria for success uh, that really promotes kind of that optimization of our entire value chain of delivery from marine with idea all the way uh, to uh, through our uh, requirements acquisition and, and budget process. And that's what we use really at our community of interest level. So how we're engaging the various functional communities and those subject matter expertise. Now that's part of our broader governance structure, how we are macroly organized across the entire information environment and across the entire um, executive level of the Marine Corps to go from idea to implementation uh, quickly and to provide transparency and visibility about our investment decisions, how uh, uh, we're uh, uh, tackling and harnessing these capabilities, and then also uh, promoting the lessons learned, because this is a journey. Uh, and uh, taking uh, stock along the way of what's working really well, what needs to be refactored or renovated, that's how, you, that's how we're achieving long-term growth and sustainment in this area. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Alka, anything from uh, Jake's perspective? Sure, no, I will echo everything Jen just said there. Those are all really, um, as well as Mike, those are all really critical points. Um, so what I'll, I'll just throw out there as like a specific uh, action or implementation effort that we're taking at the Jake is having integrated product project teams. And so really going back to the fact that there's an interdisciplinary group of individuals. So oftentimes when we're talking about AI, everyone just wants to go to the technologists, right? Like the data scientists or the developers, but AI is not um, a technology problem. It is, it is more than technology, right? It's a socio, um, socio-technical problem. And so thinking about at the very beginning of that design stage, when a use case is even identified, having in addition to the data scientists and the t &E folks, um, having policy, legal, ethics at the table uh, to really push the group to think through, hey, have we thought through all the potential consequences. Um, is AI even the solution for this problem that you're trying to solve? Maybe it's not, right? And, and so before we go down that rabbit hole, let's sort of do our due diligence from all of our lenses um, as, as we're trying to solve this problem. And so um, that is definitely something that we've been using. We recognize too, as we've been embarking on this, and especially as we work across um, the components um, with partners like Jen, is that not all these areas have these resources, right? These are these aren't resources aren't readily available, um, and so perhaps not necessarily um, having all those subject matter experts for every single meeting across the entire product product life cycle as we're developing these technologies. But like, what are those critical junctures um, that we need to pull that interdisciplinary group together? And and it really speaks to one of our principles of our responsible, which is like all of us. Um, all of us have a responsibility as we're, we're working with this technology. Um, and the fact that uh, because of AI, and I think Mike alluded to this, this is, you know, this is continuous, it's iterative. Um, we really need to be diligent because as these uh, systems learn, um, even post-deployment, right? We have to make sure that we have the, the appropriate monitoring, um, the appropriate governance to ensure that when something, when there might be emergent behavior or, or the performance is not as expected in these in these technology in these capabilities, what is our our um, disengagement or fail-safe uh, abilities to to pull back? Um, so. Uh, Sort of a long answer, but the fact of the, the, the point being is we're really trying to promote the use of these integrated project teams um, to, to tackle some of these issues. So let's go there um, in terms of building on the integrated project team uh, question. And uh, it's often said that involvement of diversity of all kinds across teams, uh, including people from different offices, different backgrounds, is important both for the success of the design, but also to think about addressing bias and mitigating bias. Um, how do you think about the uh, involvement of diverse teams um, uh, and, and their ability to help agencies incorporate ethical constructs into the way that they approach data and intelligence automation? And Elka, do you want to just continue and then we can uh, sure, hear from our speakers? Yeah, yeah, happy to. And and I want to sort of stress that, like, obviously, um, data bias is a top of mind, right? Um, and, and not to constantly focus on our principles, but one of our principles is really focused on, on minimizing, or unequitable, minimizing unintended bias. Um, but 
uh, while we can talk about um, ensuring that there's representative of the data, so we're, we're testing the data for, for bias and, and sort of also thinking about um, data sets from a training perspective versus a testing perspective, I also want to highlight the fact that biases can also be introduced by humans in the decision-making process across that life cycle. Right. So and, and when those decisions are being made, they may not necessarily, um, uh, uh, you know, they could be explicit in terms of our, our biases based on our own experiences and life experience, life um, perspective. Um, but they also might be implicit and have sort of downstream second, third order effects that are not recognized recognize that at that very point in time. And so I think when we talk about having these interdisciplinary teams, um, number one, it does, you know, you're bringing a group of individuals who have various life experiences, can, sort of, can challenge perhaps um, from their perspective and their subject matter expertise ex perspective, challenge whether the data um, aspects, uh, the decision-making aspects, frankly, the use aspects of these technologies that might not otherwise be considered in a typical development process. Um, I will say too that one of the things that I'm really cognizant of the fact is as we as we try to um, really uh, talk about adoption and integration of AI across an enterprise, there are different levels of um, understanding, right? And and so in, and even if there, despite the fact that we might have different levels of understanding in terms of maturity of, of how AI works and what, what the challenges may be with it, there's also a different use of vocabulary. So I, one quick point, um, case in point, I will just share is like, I talk about data cards and um, I was uh, having a conversation with someone else the other day and they had a totally different definition of a data card than I did. And so like, how do we even just get as the first step in terms of like, how do we get that common vocabulary amongst um, amongst all of ourselves um, so that we can really then get to some of the constructs around the bias aspects um, and and then even thinking through like, all right, and perhaps there are other ways to, to work around um, data bias, for example, maybe we should be thinking about synthetic data and, and um, you know, uh, other techniques uh, that would help minimize some of these concerns. Uh, thanks. Really interesting things for agencies to think about as they move forward in, in working with diverse teams to address bias. Um, Jen, any thoughts about applying this uh, at the Marine Corps? Uh, yes. So very much uh, we walk into our AI problem framing or problem decomposition if we've identified that AI can uh, be a solution for that with the acknowledgement that AI is a tool set that is created by humans. It is used by humans and humans have biases. Uh, and so not to be not being judgmental in any way, but being transparent. Um, that the ways that we mitigate that, though, is through that diversity of thought, uh, through that formulation of cross-functional teams. That's where the best innovation happens, because you are creating an environment of a free exchange of ideas uh, in terms of the problem decomposition, the problem solution fit. And then we're also, as we go through this journey of our design, development, and deployment, we take stock along the way. We challenge uh, our, these cross-functional teams to do pre-mortem analysis. What could go wrong? And we're always conscious to bring forward uh, the, the, you know, the bias component. And then lastly, we also highlight that an, an AI uh, tool set is a tool set. It should, it should not replace the thinking at the individual marine level. So as we're going through our design, develop, deployment cycle, we're constantly assessing how are Marines engaging with the tool set? How are they using it? Are they using it to assist them in developing a better, more robust uh, outcome, an analytical product, uh, decision space? Uh, so we really infuse diversity of thought question uh, in our team formation, and then uh, really uh, bringing in uh, rigorous uh, testing uh, and analysis along the way. Uh, Marines are smart. Marines with machines are even better. Thanks, Janet. And Mike, uh, HHS, of course, is one of the largest, most complex agencies in the civilian space, lots of different uh, sub-agencies with different missions. So diversity, obviously, is very important thinking from a headquarters perspective working across. How do you address this issue? Well, there's a, there's a very old saying that knowledge is power, and I absolutely agree with that. Shared knowledge is real power. So when you start one of these journeys, you have to understand or define what your goal is. 
And is your goal to meet the needs of the many, or are you trying to meet an individual specific goal? I think if you're if you're going down this path, you are looking at the, the needs of the many. I want my Marines to have as much information, this tangible information that they can utilize at the point in time they need it. Um, a lot of times, getting back to the bias, you will have a specific question that one assistant secretary wants answered. So when you start to go to your user stories, you start to really see where the community wants their questions answered, where they need the data. And as you start to build out the user stories, you're gonna find out that this one question that's sitting over there, that's, that's, it's, it's not that it's not important. If my assistant secretary wants this, I'm gonna give it to him. But if I'm gonna build an application, I wanna build the application towards the needs of the many. So this is where you have to balance things very, very carefully and understand what the user community is. Um, I love the idea of the integrated project teams. You know, we've utilized that previously. Um, that really will give you the user stories that are going to get you to that end goal of what you're looking for. Um, but the most important point here is data can be overwhelming. So you need to make sure that you're giving the community that needs the data, the data that they need. And that's, that's tricky. Um, if you overwhelm them with the data, um, I, I would say that a, a Marine fighting overseas, um, if they live in Michigan, they probably care about what the weather in Michigan is. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, what they're doing over there, that's not data that they need. That's not data that all the Marines over there need. So that's just an example of where you balance what it is that's needed by the community, where the community is, and how the community is going to apply that data. And I think that's really one of the things you have to understand right up front and make sure that you're not overstepping bounds with this uh, availability of unlocking data for the masses. Thanks, Mike, great, great insights. And, and one last question before we're gonna turn back to Tracy to kind of see how she's captured the conversation and then we'll get to the Q&A session with our participants. But just to close this, this segment, how do agencies get started based on your experience? We talked about data, uh, we've talked about data standards, for example, is something that can be very important in terms of of getting agencies together when they're working with disparate data sets or, or other mechanisms around um, making information timely and demonstrating use cases. If each of you could spend a minute or so just giving advice based on your experience about how to get started. And, and Mike, do you wanna kick that off? Wow, I would love to kick that off. Um, you start, and you start with the idea that you are probably likely going to fail in some of these areas and just recognize that you're going to learn more from those failures than you will from any of the successes that you're going to have. I think that is really the bottom line key ingredient. Um, in the federal government, we are as risk averse as you possibly can be. I was fortunate enough to have a deputy secretary, a chief of staff and uh, his chief of staff, as well as the, the uh, gentleman who was leading the reimagined project, tell me it was okay to fail. And so knowing that that was an option um, I didn't want to go there. I'm one of those kids who always wanted to get the 90% or above on their on their grade. Uh, but knowing it was okay if I got a 65 one time, we're going to let it go two times. Uh, did you learn something? And are you applying what you learned from it? That is the most important part of this. And it will move you further, faster than you could possibly imagine. Uh, thanks. And Jen? So this is definitely a yes and. Uh, so uh, I encourage everybody to start. And uh, to be uh, as clear as possible about that, uh, I, what I mean is you could spend all of your time trying to figure out the best place to start, or you could pick a few things. Document your assumptions, uh, document your uh, value proposition, time box what you're doing, and then show uh, the lessons learned, show the return on investment, and show where you're going to go next. Uh, oftentimes, I, I think people can be, uh, and teams can be uh, paralyzed with, back to what Mike said of, you know, is this the, the best place? In this realm, things change so fast technology changes, there's advancements in industry and academia, academia, which is super valuable to the journey. The point is to get going. I, there's a phrase in the Marine Corps of the, the hardest part of a, a, a 10 mile march is the first step. If you take that first step, you'll begin your journey. Thank you. And, and Alka, of course, the, the Jake is working across defense with the intelligence community, with partners in other countries, You've seen a lot of different examples of agencies moving forward. Any lessons learned from that variety of experience? 
Sure. Um, so, so first of all, let me just say all of the above to what Mike and Jen said. Um, I, I think my biggest observation is that there is no, um, there's no playbook for this, right? There's no one solution. It is going to be different for all of us uh, based on how our agencies and departments are set up, based on the resources, based on, frankly, um, the AI literacy of the workforce. So, so I, my, my biggest observation is that, um, you know, you might think you have the answer, uh, but it may not, most likely will not be the answer, or it's not exactly the same answer and it needs to be tweaked and customized. And so my, one of my biggest learnings has frankly been like, all right, what are these wonderful best practices out there? Um, and to Jen's point, like, let's test this out. And one of the, the, the key points that I would suggest is that as, as um, uh, agencies and, and folks across the government Work on work in the space. Like when you test it out, test it out with a low consequence application, right? Like you're not gonna go a hundred percent in or a thousand percent in with with the high sensitive application that could have critical ramifications. Start with 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 something of low consequence. Um, see if it works. If it doesn't, iterate. Um, the the other thing I would I would echo. I think that's already been said. Is is sharing out those learnings is critical. Um, and again, just because it worked in one situation or in one place doesn't mean it's always going to work the same way. And so being diligent um, around uh, this concept is really important. And I will say the last point is like documentation. Um, so I am all about documentation. Um, and as we think about it from an application perspective for traceability, but frankly, as we're doing these learnings, um, for his for institutional knowledge, like let's document what 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 we were doing. When did it work? Where were the points? It helps us identify where were the points of failure. Where might we need to pivot, or what might we need to do differently? So I would just add documentation to to some of the efforts as well. What a great playbook from the three of you in terms of how to get started. Thank you for those insights. So we're going to take a break from the panel. Um, Mike and Alpha and Jen will be back in a few minutes. But let's check in with Tracy, who's been capturing the discussion. Um, Tracy, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about what you've learned over the last half hour? Sure. Um, my head is exploding. I've learned a lot, and I'll show you the things that I've captured visually and point out the um, wonderful uh, comments and information that I heard. Um, uh, we heard about intelligent uh, automation from Leanne Hazelton and um, also heard from Elka, obviously, and Jennifer and Michael. So some of the quotes that I heard that I illustrated here was that it's more human-centric than we think. It's not all about better and faster. It's about better informed decisions. Um, uh, we heard about the education efforts that Alka mentioned a very important and the one year anniversary and she's ethics policy. Jennifer spoke about an AI enabled um, Marine Corps where I tried to make some drawings of Marines and machines. Um, they're high-fiving each other over here um, because the power of machines and Marines um, to unleash that is, is a goal. Um, we heard a lot about um, user-centric um, design decisions and processes. And, um, well, Mike mentioned that the federal government is risk-adverse, that we learn from failure. And I drew this piece here, talking to people is so important, to hear what they have to say. Not everyone is always going to have the same feedback. So it's important to start small, be agile, question if something, if you got something right. Um, the technology that you're all talking about, AI, demands responsibility and appropriate government management. And there are times when you need to pull back I heard getting ethics on the table. I was a little literal in my drawing. I put ethics on the table. Um, and to make sure that project teams also are integrated, that AI shouldn't be running the show. It is a technology, and it's not always the right solution. That the socio-technical problem and the awareness of critical junctures makes it necessary to pull back and see if AI is the correct solution. Um, I think I already mentioned integrated project teams. Teams. Um, and also, I heard you talk about vocabulary being something that needs to be better defined because people aren't using the same terms in the same way and creating misunderstanding would certainly not be uh, 
something that you want to go towards. Um, there was a talk about sometimes finding the best technology uh, is, is the real issue. And one technology at the moment requires 17 clicks. And we all know what that's like um, to get to the data. So that's not, a, you know, that's, that's not a success. Um, risk assessments to dive in and look at what actions might be breaking the system. Um, are there apps to make life easier for every day? Um, unlocking data for public information and usage was also something that came up. Uh, and data analytics itself needs to uh, be used appropriately and it can be effective for government now more than ever. ever. Um, and uh, there's a lot of data falling from the sky over here. And uh, the future trends to benefit could be also saving money, predicting spending. Um, and uh, positive outcome is the goal. That's a terrific um, uh, summary. And we're going to make your, your picture available as part of the artifacts from the session. Um, so people will be able to follow the, the uh, flow that you have portrayed in addition to reflecting back on the insights from our speakers uh, in the video. So really tremendous contribution. So let me bring back in our panel. Um, and we're going to go to, um, to audience Q&A uh, uh, momentarily. So, uh, Jen, would you like to just say a little bit about uh, what you thought of the, the picture? And then we'll, we'll hear from our other two speakers and bring them back on. Uh, so this is the first time I've been part of a meeting where it's been captured graphically. Uh, so this is a, a, a new experience uh, for me. So this is, uh, I have to say, uh, the ability to synthesize that much diverse information in one drawing uh, is, is quite the challenge. Uh, it also reinforces some of our tool sets that we use within the Marine Corps. Uh, we encourage Marines to draw a lot, particularly in that problem framing. Um, and so this is uh, opening my aperture to how that thought process that we use for design can be applied to other areas. Thanks, Jen. Mike, any thoughts? Um, so we've actually used this process before, but uh, again, I am astounded by, as Tracy goes through this, I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I didn't even mention the idea that we've got to build these systems from an interoperable perspective. Um, you don't know who the consumer of your data is going to be long term. So if you're going to take this journey and all this effort, let's make it available to anybody who actually needs it. Um, we used a microservices approach on ours so that um, basically anybody who wants to get the information either through a formulaic URL or a, a simple API can get to the data. But the drawing just kind of like brought that back to me as Tracy was talking to it. And I, and I just, I love it. Great, and Alka, are you still there? Any any uh, thoughts on the drawing? In summary? I am. Um, so I just kudos to Tracy. That was amazing, and I can't wait to like actually zoom in and see all of that wonderful artwork and 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 capturing our our thoughts. Um, definitely uh, kudos to you for for doing that. Um, I think that's probably the beginning of that playbook we were talking about, right? Like as we're all sort of thinking about what are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities as we think about data. So I think. Um, uh, as I said, I'm really excited to, to take a look at, at, at that in, in more detail. Um, great, so we're all back and we have questions that people have included, so we're gonna start. Um, and the first question is actually, Jen, for you. Um, can you expand how you're using technology to support your the Marine Corps' workforce modernization goal? Uh, so sure. Uh, so I, I'd also I'd like to kind of begin my response with what does uh, workforce modernization look like as it relates to AI? Um, I'll say the old model, uh, the traditional government model is very much web based training. Everybody must be trained. You get your certificate at the end and you do this on an annual basis. We deliberately uh, tried to think through this challenge uh, differently. So uh, from an AI uh, and data familiarization perspective, really looking holistically of what are our user uh, personas? What do different uh, uh, MOSs, different G, uh, GS employees, what do they need to know in the context of uh, their day-to-day -day jobs to be done? So as part of the modernization, it wasn't a one uh, blanket policy of everybody must be trained. It was targeted tra training to produce an outcome. Uh, 
Um, so that's one vein of our workforce modern uh, workforce development. The other vein is how do we uh, really look at our current uh, civilian and military structure? Where do we really need to invest in uh, 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 upskilling, uh, in uh, immersive training uh, opportunities? Uh, and how do we start to modernize uh, some of these existing job series or uh, uh, marine uh, uh, occupational specialties to meet the challenges of the future? Uh, one area, uh, lastly, that I'm really excited about is with capabilities uh, that you find uh, within the DOD right now, with uh, the Avada platform, with work at the Jake. How can we actually use AI to make more informed decisions in this area? Um, things like Joint Common Foundations at Havana uh, provide platforms, platforms where we can bring in multiple disparate data types about our, wor our, our workforce, our uh, training pipelines, and start to actually put, uh, layer those uh, tools on top of it to make better decisions. So it's an exciting time uh, to be part of uh, the, the DOD. Thanks, Jen. Great, great to answer to that question. And we have a, a sort of a more general question about the future of government and the broad suite of intelligent automation technologies. We haven't really talked about blockchain. Um, of course, we, we talked a little bit about robotics process automation, but but how do we think that these technologies will will be implemented by government in the future in terms of providing services and also uh, addressing issues? We talked before about bias, but also addressing issues of data privacy, risk assessment, um, Alka, do you want to start with that one? Um, sure. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily going to dive into the blockchain specifics, but just thinking through like uh, data privacy and impact assessments. And, and the one thing I do want to um, say before we get too, too far on this conversation, we've been talking a lot about data, obviously, and um, data is critical. It's a critical piece to, to how we um, develop and use these technologies. But, um, you know, when we think about data governance and, and even with the JCF, well, it is meant to be able to have folks pro provide uh, various data sets and then allow for sharing. There is a need to have the necessary mechanisms and controls in place to, to minimize and con have control so that that data isn't just accessible to everyone for any kind of use, right? Um, so these data sets are going to come with their own constraints. And so how are we making sure that those constraints travel with that data set and doesn't just automatically become open and, and um, available for, for any purpose? So um, one of the things that, uh, you know, when I go back to our integrated project teams and I think about the fact that policy and ethics are at the table. So as, again, like any type of project or problem statement or, or use cases being identified, really having sort of those, deal, uh, those conversations around, um, you know, are there privacy con considerations? Um, even if the data is anonymized, is there a concern that when we aggregate them together, you can still piece uh, and, and, and uh, be able to um, identify individuals from, from some other aspects once that data set, those data sets are aggregated. And so um, recognizing that there are these different types of concerns based on different use cases or and or the technology. Um, knowing where to go, frankly, within the government to pull from those resources is really important. So for example, we we have um, our the CMO, our, our privacy uh, subject matter experts that we would pull in. Um, we would ensure that the necessary private impact assessments are done and so forth. Um, so I think that's really, that's another sort of value add to having these integrated interdisciplinary teams as part of the project teams. The other piece I will say too is like, there is still a lot of work to be done, especially as we think about AI um, in, in terms of uh, some of the nascency around the research that is still occurring um, and or the tools that are available, right? And so uh, in under the recent NDAA uh, that was signed earlier this year, there are aspects in there that talk about um, certain risk assessments for, for emerging technologies um, having emerging, uh, emerging, emerging technology steering committees. Um, uh, and, and I think those kind of actions where you can tap into academia and, and commercial uh, industry partners who are working in that space or maybe ahead in their advancement is a really critical partnership um, for us at the government to, to also think about how we have our own practices but then also the creation of certain um, assessments, which uh, NIST has been cited as, as having, to, having to work on. I mean, you think all of those pieces are in the works and it's a matter of pulling them, coordinating all those efforts and, and bringing them all together. Sorry, that may have been a little too long-winded, yeah. but hopefully that, I got that was, 
<laughs> terrific. And hit a, I think it hit a lot of the questions. And we have just a couple of minutes left. There are a couple of questions uh, around um, sort of how do we ensure that user needs, that the, the needs of an individual are met. We've talked a lot about sort of diverse teams and a whole of agency approach and, and um, uh, understanding sort of how to apply this knowledge and make it real to a user at an individual level. Um, uh, anybody have experience with sort of working with that? Sort of how do they apply that in their day-to-day -day jobs? So I'd love to, I can answer that kind of tagging on to the last question. Um, when we started the work that we did, part of the use case was at the end of the day in doing a risk assessment. Anybody recognize one of these things? Pretty, pretty thick file, right? We are utilizing blockchain so that at the point in time that somebody is running a risk assessment, it is storing all the information, point in time information on the blockchain. So any auditor can go back and this artifact is now digital the impact to the user is huge because when you pull one of these together, it's a, it's a lot of work. You have to then store it. Then if you lose it, you've got an audit finding. So if you think about the idea that if I went in today at 1026 in the morning on my blockchain, it's going to say Mike Peckham checked grantee A or grant recipient A on this date at this time and here's exactly what they looked like. Here's all the information that anybody can pull up. The power of that's just incredible. Just absolutely incredible. Um, we weren't originally planning on use, utilizing the blockchain. I mean, blockchain was out there, it was buzzword. Perfect application for how we could use it. So we did. Thanks, and, and Jen, any final thoughts? Uh, so I, I'd like to kind of end where we began about uh, our grounding concept is really unleashing the power of the individual Marine. Uh, and focusing uh, back to that question about how, do, how are we engaging, how are we meeting the needs of the individual, um, I think it's important to note um, that these types of uh, work methods provide uh, the opportunity for uh, individuals to see their uh, quick uh, development and transition of the idea. A lot of times in historic cases in acquisition, you put all the requirements down. Several years later, you may or may not see uh, uh, what you had originally envisioned. So shortening that uh, idea to implementation time really pays um, some big, uh, some big uh, dividends. And also, um, this is really an, uh, an ecosystem. Innovation isn't just you know th you know three people in a room thinking good thoughts. It's that full contact sport. And all of us, we focused a lot today on our you know government viewpoints, but all of us in industry and in academia, uh, across government, we all have roles to play here, and we all have opportunities to join uh, together to, uh, to, de to deliver real results for our users. Well, thanks for making that point, Jen. And it's one of the primary missions of the IBM Center for the Business of Government to bring together the best ideas in academia and bring them forward to government working in partnership with industry and, and government uh, together. So great note to end on. I want to thank all of our panelists for just tremendous insights today. And the interplay really has been terrific uh, as a build, a build from uh, our individual discussions with you last year. So thank you again. We'll continue to be in touch. Thanks to all of our participants. Uh, um, there's always uh, uh, so many questions and, so, and not enough time to get to them, but we will um, keep the questions and, and continue to use them in our dialogues with, with government leaders uh, and uh, working across the industry and with academia in the future. So thank you for submitting those questions. So now I'm going to introduce our, our last uh, team of speakers. Um, uh, thanks again to our panel. Uh, First, I'd like to bring back Tracy Berglund. Tracy, I know you've been uh, still working on the uh, drawing. You want to just uh, say a word or two? Um, thank you, Dan. It was wonderful. I learned so much. Um, I'm going to take a look at my own board later to reinforce what I've learned. And I love the last quote that Jen made. Innovation is a contact sword. So I'll end on that. Well, thank you, Tracy. And now I'd like to bring in um, Katie Malay from uh, the partnership, uh, who's been watching this and, and learning along with me for the last hour, Katie. Dan, hi, I'm back. Uh, this was such a great discussion. I I'll say, as I reflect on the discussion, I'm going to keep in mind that there's no playbook. We should just start the full contact sport, and you'll learn more from failure than success. I also remember the uh, Marines with machines. <laughs> That's great. And then finally, to close this out, I'd like to introduce my colleague, IBM, Claude Eusti, who's our, our leader for intelligent automation services with Federal. 
Uh, Claude, you've been listening to this whole discussion. Um, feel free to summarize some key takeaways that you, you took. Uh, it was a great education on what's developing. You know, if I reflect back on last year's conversations, people were treating a lot of this like an experiment. Uh, does this work? Can I use it? Where could I use it? And now there's a series of proof points uh, that have generated real results. But I think the real maturity that's occurring is how everybody who came back to user-centered design and how we help the person get something done and keeping that in mind as we progress. So it's not that we should be searching for intelligent automation problems or AI problems. It's that it's part of our uh, capabilities to solve problems that we solve all the time. So it extends the range of what we're able to accomplish. And I thought the other point of uh, a real encouragement is this idea of interdisciplinary going across an agency, going across many representatives of different roles, the citizen who's increasingly going to have a voice in how government uses AI and intelligent automation because they're affected by it. All of these are very positive developments and it, it shows a lot of promise for the future. Well, well, thanks, Claude. Great insights to close. And uh, thanks again to our terrific panel, to uh, our, our colleagues at the Partnership for Public Service, to the team behind the scenes who made this event happen, um, all of my colleagues across the IBM Center and, and IBM and, and at the partnership. If you want to know more about um, uh, this topic, we are releasing today, and it's available on the IBM Center for the Business of Government and the Partnership for Public Service website. We have a, an issue brief about improving uh, outcomes in government through intelligent automation. Uh, and driving data. Um, and you can read that. It's a summary of the learnings that we did for the last year that um, uh, you will put in context today's discussion. Uh, you'll also be able to access uh, there all of the webinars and all of the um, summary blogs from, from those sessions. So it's an, a, a really a rich repository uh, for you and your agencies and your colleagues uh, in, um, in nonprofits and companies working with agencies um, to move forward in understanding really best practice in, in how to use intelligent automation and, and data to drive uh, improved outcomes in government. So thank you all again for joining us today, um, and we look forward to seeing you soon.